All right, so who am I? Why are you here? What are we going to talk about? So I'm here to talk to you about the future of digital marketing in Web3. One of the most interesting things about Web3 is that every time I say to people who aren't aware of it, there is hesitation, there's anxiety, that's like, what the fuck are you talking about? What is Web3? When did I miss one and two? Where are we? Is this the United States? Show of hands, who knows what Web3 is? All right, cool, okay. I'm hoping in this presentation I can condense my very limited understanding of what I believe Web3 is and the evolution we're going into. But before we go there, I'm going to tell you a bit about who I am and, and where we are today. So, I like to tell people my career started in healthcare by accident. I actually went to school to be a lawyer. I wanted to change the world through social justice. And then I realized that our lawyers don't make a lot of money. Um, and I happened to be having dinner one day with a mate of mine who was an OBGYN in one of the most prominent hospitals in the UK. She had just quit her job, and we were talking a lot about what it was she was going to do next. So I said, hey, congratulations. You just quit your job in the most uncertain economical times of the world. What are you going to do? And she looked at me and said, you know, I really don't know what I'm going to do. No, I did. But I do know what I feel called to do. So I got back up my interest going. And she looked at me in the eyes, reached her hand across the table and said, I think you're the one. And I looked at her and said, um, where's Tim, your husband of 11 years? Where, where is he, by the way? And she said, not that way, silly. She said, I want to go around the world opening healthcare clinics all over Africa, and I believe that you're the one to help me do that. <laughs> Fucking hilarious you are. <laughs> go around the world opening clinics. I went to school for law. What's wrong with you? Um, I said, you know, I'm not really interested. I'm going to go home. We met up the next day. And something about her mission just really called to me. So we spent three years building the foundation of what we needed to open healthcare clinics. No idea what healthcare was really, apart from going to the doctors once or twice a year and telling me that I needed some vitamin D. Um, and over those three years, we opened five different clinics in three different countries. I, when I say that, it still blows my mind, right? I went from no knowledge about healthcare to opening five clinics in three years. So I thought, all right, this is cool, this is fun. I want to keep challenging myself in this way and I want to be able to grow. I love helping people, but like I also want to make a bit of money. So I went into software, went into telecommunication sales. And a lot of what I did was selling telecommunication software to large enterprise companies. And over the course of seven, eight years, that's what I did. I did it in a software development world. I built global teams for large enterprise companies. And I spent a lot of time with engineers. I'm going to tell you one fun fact about engineers. They're fucking weird people. <laughs> and if you're watching and you're an engineer, I am not sorry. Your mind is beautiful. The way you live your life may be not, but your mind is beautiful. Right? These are people who are really great about building things. They understand the technicality of what it takes to build and what is necessary to make tools function. And over that time, I realized I've been a part of some really great things that have been built. And those great things have gone nowhere. Companies have spent millions of dollars building excellent, life-changing tools that have gone nowhere. Do you know why? All right. Do you know why? No. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Um, they go nowhere because there is no marketing presence, right? One of the things I've learned about the transitions of the industries I've been in is that healthcare is basically building relationships. Technology is building tools to enable relationships. 
Marketing. <laughs> this is why marketing is so powerful. Marketing is helping people connect the dots between the tools that were built and the relationships and exploring that perception. Marketing is powerful. So I thought, all right, time to join another company. Off I go. I joined a small marketing company called Project Line Services that was now acquired by Accenture. Don't ask me why we got there. Um, but I've been in marketing now for five years and I've been in marketing building large marketing services, small marketing services, helping enterprise companies build their marketing expertise and really helping companies create resonant content that is truly powerful to the audiences that they're looking for. Like I told you earlier, I am a big data guy. I enjoy data, but I've learned over six years now that it is extremely important to tell the story with data. Numbers are boring. So it's a bit about me. Probably wondering why The Rock is on the screen, because I would be. I can tell you he's not here. He's not watching virtually, and I am not related to him in any way, shape, or form. But I can tell you why The Rock is here. The Rock is here because I've learned that sometimes companies want to market us Barack Obama, but they show us The Rock, right? We're not marketing in a way that's resonant to people. We're trying to tell a story. We're trying to share a message, but we're using the wrong, in, we're using the wrong content. We're using the wrong assets. We're not using the right words. All right, well, apparently I've skipped the other slides. I was going to say that companies want to show us lovely Mr. Neil Diamond because he's a treasure, but they really mean kiss, right? We've got to learn to market in a way that is resonant with the audiences that we're looking for. That means learning how they talk, learning where they are, learning who they are, using all of the data that we have available to us so that it's resonant to where we're trying to make it go. So I'll tell you a bit about Messier. Number one, I've only been there for four months. So uh, I'm gonna tell you what I know in my time of four months. Matthew started in 1987 and we started in good old England. And during that time, a lot of what we did was around public relations. So really helping companies shape their images and brand development work. And what we realized was we have a lot of clients and a lot of customers who are in the technology space, right? We were marketing with technologists, but we weren't using their technology. And so, once upon a time, with our really cool people and our right place and right time, we started to mix the story of marketing with technology. And that was exponentially crazy. And that's gonna lead me into the evolution of Web 1, Web 2, and Web3. So Matthew is a global company. We've got offices in Singapore, London, Austin, and clearly in Seattle. So we're kind of all over the place. We're also a really small company. We've got less than 140 people. And being a small company allows us to be nimble and agile, which is what I've learned is the most important thing with the marketers and the companies that we work for. Matthew can also kind of do everything. It's one of the reasons I joined. All right, Web1. Timeline, 1991, 2004. This is the era that I like to call consumers are driven to learn. So if you remember the instance of Kearns, does anybody know what Kearns is? All right, cool. I won't talk about it. But Web 1, right? Think about this era where a lot of marketing and a lot of information was available in books, in print, in newspapers, flyers, banners, like things you could physically touch, right? Web1 came about and changed that. It made information accessible to everybody, right? And it did that through static images. So you could go on the internet and Google or do whatever at the time. How do I build a birdhouse? And you would get a repository of all of that information, but you could read it. The tagline I have prescribed to Web1 is the error of what we saw on paper, now on colored screen maybe, and catalogs of information. So it was an era where people were driven to learn. People wanted to learn. People wanted to explore as much of their human existence as possible by doing many things. What did we learn? <laughs> so we learned four really important things. We learned number one, 
content drives traffic, right? If you have resonant specific content, people want to know what it is. And if it applies to their life, they want to go look for it. We also learned that because content drives traffic, content that teaches consumers is more likely to influence their buying behavior. That's a powerful lesson. It's a powerful lesson. Two, we learned that teaching in itself is influence. If you are teaching someone, again, how to build a birdhouse, you are influencing their behaviors and how they think about the limit of what they can and can't do. So it's no longer an error of, well, shit, dad didn't teach me how to build a birdhouse, now I have to build it on my own. It's now the error of, you know what, fuck it, I can do it by myself. I'm going to go on the internet and look for it. Three, we're all connected, right? Hundreds, you're getting too excited, stay there. All right, hundreds, um, hundreds, almost millions of people are viewing the same types of content at once, right? That in itself has a story. Number four, scariest part of them all, they can see you. We can see you. We learn in the era of web one that we can see the device information that people have, people are using, right? I can tell you if somebody is central in the UK or in Germany and they're consuming this data, we have so much access to data. All right, Web 2.0, from 2005 to present day. This slide is kind of an eyesore, but there are a couple of things that I want you to focus on. I want you to focus on the timeline and some of the companies and the timeline that it correlates to Web 2.0 becoming a thing. Web 2.0 is the era that we are currently in. It is the era of consumers are being influenced. We are influencing them. Wow. Do you know what it means to influence someone? We're all bloody marketers. Thank you, Ryan. Please tell the, tell the class what influence means. Thank you. We now have so much access to data that we can influence people's behavior. Wild, right? Where else are we supposed to go from this? We have so much access. So you look at Web 2. Web 2.0 is now the iteration of interactive data. So we've learned all those four things from the slides before, but we've now realized that in this interactive data, the more people interact, the more they stay on the websites, the more they stay on apps, the more they interact with our resonant content, the more information we collect. And now we can collect Lots of information about people, not just the device they're using, the sites that they visited, the type of sites they visited. You remember um, Priyanka saying rage clicks. We can see how many times someone is clicking on something, right? We can see a lot of information. So the tagline I prescribed to Web 2.0 is stay longer. I need more information from you without you knowing. Yeah. All right, so what do we know today? We know four things. I've boiled this down to four things. Number one, we can almost see everything, literally. We can almost see everything. One of the things that scares me about being a data person is that I've realized that all of this data isn't just data, it is a story, it is a persona. We have intelligent data that creates the persona of who people are in a way that helps us predict and influence their behavior, not just their behavior, how they think, what we want them to do, and ultimately what we want them to buy, right? Number two, content now influences behavior trends and thinking. Number three, we can almost predict consumer behavior once we understand how they engage with our content. Shit. <laughs> Number four is the scariest for me. Digital footprint is now larger than ever. Read this fact, right? All right, let's pick somebody in the room. YOLO! YOLO. Read number four for us, please. You know what? What the fuck? What? I know, it's bloody excited, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it says digital footprint is larger than ever. Did you guys hear that? Yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? 
Remember that one pop up that you saw for this like cute, adorable puppy? And you're like, oh, this is cute. Click. Rage click or compassion click. I don't know what we're going to yeah. call it. Click. Let me see this puppy's picture. Well, apparently there was a third party company involved there and they were storing a bunch of information that you had no idea about. Now we get to Web 3.0. My God. Just when you thought shit can get any worse, right? Web 3.0. It's actually getting better. Timeline. Probably soon. I fucking know. We're probably developing it as we speak, right? It is... Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not really even defined. So if I told you that I would tell you what Web3 was, I lied. And now you're here. So let's keep going. It is the era where consumers want to be taught and have the right to choose when they are influenced. We now know that all these companies have information about us. We now know that that random puppy I clicked on by compassion has now told somebody that I am in Germany and I live probably close to a train railroad station thing, right? Information that we didn't want to give out. So the tagline, um, did you ask me for my permission? That is what Web 3.0 is about. Web 3.0 is about the era of privacy and information and who owns that information and what they get to profit from it. It is a powerful era. And if you are a marketer, you understand that the amount of data that we have is fucking scary. It is scary. And now we're moving into an era where people want control over that data. Fucking slide, if you move one more time. All right, people want access to that data, right? They want to know that my information about how frequently I order my dog food is given to you because I told you you could have it. Right? It's consent. So, what are we learning? We're learning the emergence of privacy concerns. We are learning that people now know that we're basically secretly spying on them and we're building all our marketing tactics around the information they didn't give us. They know this now, right? Number two, we're learning financial control of people's information. People are saying, am I the market or am I being marketed to? Right? People are saying, where do you get, why do you get to profit from my information? Right? Why is it that I didn't give you this information, but now you've made a whole marketing campaign to target people like me? And why do you get to profit from it? Right? And when we think about things like NFTs, I'm not going to go into NFTs because that is just, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. People are paying $9 million for fucking monkeys and the people are still hungry. So that's a whole different thing. But NFTs, NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens. What that means to you is it's literally the ability to take physical property, transform it digitally, and then tokenize it so that you can understand who has access to that piece of thing that you now own. It is literally revolutionary. It's, it's mind-blowing. A lot of what we see, fuck you now. <laughs> a lot of what we see with NFTs is NFT art, but it doesn't encompass what NFT actually means. So we're learning financial controls. Controls over what is seen. People want to know what information of theirs we have access to, and people want consent. People just want consent. I want to know that I have okayed you to know where I live. I want to know that I've okayed you to know my kids. I want to know that I've okayed you to create a profile or a persona about me and people like me so that you can profit. So the future, what is it now? Oh my God, this is fucking scary. We're marketers, we all want to know where the world is going into and we all want to know how we create more marketing content that's more resonant, that captures more information. Introducing Transcending Reality, otherwise known as the Metaverse. The Metaverse. What is the Metaverse? I'm going to read this. Again, this, I didn't steal this from anywhere. This is how I'm conceptualizing what the Metaverse is. So if you feel differently, tell me. A world where you can do whatever you want, be whoever you want, act and explore your deepest, darkest desires in the most safest, non-threatening, simulated environments of your dream. Cool, huh? 
That means we can fly to work. <laughs> that means we can jump off a 20-story building and be alive. That means we can pour coffee on our random avatar because we feel like doing it. That means we can Grand Theft Auto any car we want and not be arrested, right? It's really cool. Actually, the metaverse is kind of cool. But wait, there's a catch because there's always a catch. We can see you. Obviously, we can see you. We know. We knew we could see you in Web 1, Web 2.0. We knew that. But we can see what you interact with. We can see how you interact with it. We can see who you interact with. And we can see how you and who you interact with interact with the things that you interact. That is a whole level of behavioral marketing that we don't even really understand. Not only can we see the digital footprint of people, we can now see how people behave. So I can not just tell you how hard you click that mouse, I can tell you if you're picking your nose while doing it. I can tell you if you are somebody who, I don't know, somebody who does weird things in their private time, I don't know, fucking weirdness is, weirdness is, 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 is whatever it is, right? I can watch you interacting with the world in a way that you didn't really realize. And I can do it in a gamified way. So now you don't know that I'm watching you. And now not only can I see your information, I can see who you are, I can see what you do, I can see how you behave. I can now market to you in a way that will subconsciously and consciously unlock whatever action it is I want from you. Holy shit, holy shit. Are you all scared? Uh, how are you feeling? Joshua, how are you feeling? Great. Okay, all right. <laughs> Yolo, how are you feeling? Hmm? <laughs> all right, well, 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 Yolo's your person. Rachel, how are you feeling? <laughs> Why are you confused, Rachel? Is Okay. You know what? When I presented this to my team, they said the same thing. Um, we were having a conversation with a client and the client started talking to us about Web3 and the metaverse and how she wants to start leading marketing in the metaverse. And I've been talking about this for years now. People like kind of look at you like, yeah, you're crazy, shut the fuck up. But when a large enterprise client who leads global marketing comes to me and says, hey, I want to market in the metaverse, that means that what I perceived would happen is kind of happening right now. So if you're confused, I'm going to give you a card. We should talk about this a bit later. It's going to affect the way we market. I heard somebody uh, got legally married in the metaverse. Can't imagine what the divorce would be like there. You're going to have to split up your land and all that. Yes, your digital land. Yeah. You are going to have to split it up with your digital babies and your digital dog. I don't fucking know the matter. They, they never met each other, but they got legally married in the metaverse. So. But that's, that's, that's what happens. That's what's happening right now. Right, there's online dating. You meet somebody on fucking Tinder, you don't know if they're a serial killer, and you go have coffee, and you're like, all right, well, this person's all right. You, you don't know this person, but you decided to put your whole life in this person's hand who you met online. What? You met this person online. Crazy, right? That's the world we're going in. It's cool. So, what now? How do we, as marketers, market in the most effective way, knowing all of this information? <laughs> Four steps, I clearly like the number four. It's a spirit number for me, so. <laughs> number one, use what you already have. All that data that I'm talking about, it's cool, it's new, it's emerging, but also we're going into an era where people are gonna have control over that data now. It still doesn't mean you don't have a lot of access to that data, right? So be intelligent with it. Be, be, be as scrutinous about the data as you can be. Look at what you have access to and let that help you guide how you market to your marketing segments and audiences, right? Think about the data you have. Number two, know that we are moving into an era where ownership of data is important. This is probably the most, well, <clears throat> second most important thing here, but 
you know we're moving into an era where privacy is a concern for people, right? You know we're moving into an era where people want consent. People want to consent to their data being used. We're moving into an era where people know that we have all this data on them. So if you know that, why not build your marketing tools and processes with this information in mind, right? Don't be weird about it. I'm gonna knock this computer down, buddy Aaron, where are you? <laughs> um, <laughs> You know that, right? You know that cons privacy is a concern. It's basically like knowing, it's like getting in a relationship and knowing what someone's triggers are. And then all of a sudden you're like, nah, I don't give a fuck about your triggers. I'm going to go just trigger you because I want to, right? It's disrespectful. It's not respectful to the people that we're marketing to. We need to market respectfully. It is not just important to create campaigns and content that resonates with the with people, it is important to do it knowing that we respect the people who we're marketing to. So build the tools and the processes and the campaigns that follow that respect. Number three, this is probably the most important thing. Stop doing things that aren't working. I don't care about the rest of what I've said. Stop doing things that aren't working. The thing that I hate the most, the one hate is the really strong word, but it's how I feel. The thing I hate the most is when I hear marketers or when I hear people in general tell me I'm doing this because this is how it's always been done. I don't care that this is how it's always been done. That's not important, right? We need to do things that make sense and we need to do things that really help us get to the goals that we're trying to get to, right? Well, I spend a lot of time with my clients a lot of what I do is either playing architect of solution or therapist. Some of you are market, some of you are client focusing, so you know, right? You ever had an hour meeting with a client and the client has spent 45 minutes of that time telling you about the argument that she had with her husband, how much she misses her dog, whether she is going to eat broccoli for dinner tonight or how she probably fancies her personal trainer. Have you ever had those conversations? <laughs> I have them all the time. <laughs> I have them all the time. Something about my face says, tell me everything about you. And that's cool. I like to listen. I like to listen to people. It's all right. But when I'm playing Solutions Architect, when I'm playing with marketers, this is why I said, well, oh my God, bloody hell, stop moving. For the next like 35 minutes, we're going to spend some time just talking through. I usually like to recap as you folks know. I'm not going to do that. I've been talking for two days straight. It's time for me to shut up. So I'm going to pass this chat thing around and the, I'm all, I'm going to hear from you folks. I want to hear what the most impactful conversations of the past two days have been for you. I want to know what you've learned. I want to know what you would like to learn in the future. I want to know if there's anybody here that has changed your life, right? So let's talk. Um, let's go around. Mike, you've got the thing. Why don't you start off? Sure. Um, I actually connected Garrett's speech with, um, I believe his name was Ben from Microsoft yesterday. Uh, he actually, Ben made a comment at the end of his presentation about Discord. He sees it becoming a bigger thing and obviously working for a coding school, yeah. Discord's already a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. But combining that with the idea of making a bridge to people who might be afraid to enter the coding education space because they don't feel like they'll be good enough yet or something like that. I feel like a Discord server just inviting them, allowing to, them to either talk to current students, alumni, or even us, uh, our academic team, would be a great version of a bridge for that. So thinking of a way I can implement that or even convince my academic team to yeah. <laughs> sign up for helping monitor that. So yeah. that was a really cool inspiration, I think, that I've gotten from two of the different speakers today. Good. Is any of that resonating with anyone? Okay. All right. All right. One person Thanks, Garrett. Your talk was already very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's pass it around. Joshua, how are you, sir? I'm swell. Good. So this, the last couple of days have given me some perspective on just our overall strategy that we've been implementing at my company. I think that um, something that you said really resonated with me, and it also drives me nuts, is there are people who have processes that they follow, and when you ask them why, it is because that's how it's always been done. And it drives me nuts probably as much as it drives you nuts. Um, and I'm finding, based on conversations that I've had with 
a lot of you awesome people is that um, the processes that we are doing because they have been what we've done in the past just aren't working. Um, and it's it's just kind of giving me perspective as to reevaluate like some of the reasons why we're doing things um, and not necessarily, you know, rip and replace right away, but really, you know, take on new strategies to really push the boundaries. When I started in my position, you know, nine months ago, I told my managers and the higher ups that I need a position where I can fail fast because I see that a lot of people do things because it's the way that they were done and it's not the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, so I feel like the biggest takeaway for me this week and or week or whatever, um, time is relative, but uh, I feel like I have plenty of great ideas to implement across my marketing organization. Um, and now I think the tools that I could, you know, sell to the higher ups to say, Hey, this is what I can, what I need to be successful. Yeah. So I just want to, I want to say, I appreciate everybody that I've talked to and all the conversations we've had, because I feel like I've learned a lot and I now have reinforcements to improve my marketing organization. Well, let's give everyone a round of applause. You've all done really great today. Thank you. You know, I, um, I'm going to give you a piece of advice that I've learned. It's taken me like 10 plus years to learn this. If you're ever at an organization and you have done everything humanly possible to make the case for why you should change and they still say no, leave. That's probably really bad advice for companies watching now. And they're like, we want to get more people. But that's the truth. If you meet resistance to change, at every single level, it's not worth it. You wanna go where you make the most impact. You wanna go where you are celebrated, not tolerated. So, all right, let's pass it along. YOLO, I'm committed to remembering every single one of your names now. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm good. Um, thank you for the great emceeing and the thank keynotes. You. It was uh, it was really informative and uh, yeah, lots to take away. I, I mean, I'm thinking about building a uh, a marketing division in our company too. So I think I, I've also just uh, ingested a bunch of great content that I can uh, watch for when I'm when I'm hiring specialists in this area. And uh, yeah, great event overall. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. If you ever want advice on hiring marketing specialists, all of these people could probably help you. I could probably help you too. You just let me know. All you need to do is copy and paste the Drake song into it and I'll know who you are. We'll set up a meeting. That's right. Don't remind me, Brittany. Yeah. Yes. I nailed it. Thank nice. you. Um, gosh, I don't even know. I don't know what to say. I've just really been taking everything in, and I've really loved getting to know so many people. And a lot of you do things that are totally different than what I do, but it's interesting to see how, even through our differences, a lot of what we do on a day to day kind of still kind of pushes the boundaries of. Um, I mean, it's easy to get into a routine at work. So I will definitely be going back next week and breaking up what the routine has been for a while. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Brittany, would you remind us of what you do? What, what about what you do is different than what everybody else does? So I do social media coordination for a marine group. So we sell boats. We sell um, wake boats, custom wood boats. Um, and some used inventory, and then we manage a fleet of five cruise boats on Lake Coeur d'Alene. So it's a mix of services and experiences. Yeah. Cool. Okay. What is the biggest problem of your company, your organization? What's the biggest problem you face? I'm actually, so I'm brand, I'm brand new to this sector, and um, before this, we had one gal managing our marketing department. They had the director of marketing, and that was it. And so she has recently been able to hire me on the social media side, and then um, another gal that manages all of our internal and local events. And so we are in expansion mode. The budget is boosted. It's it's awesome. I mean, it's a huge weight, weight off her shoulders, and some really good changes are in place so she doesn't quit. So, mm, yeah. <laughs> you know what I've learned to do with marketing or companies that have one person marketing team is that I convince them to take the budget that they would have used for that one person, convert that into agency spend. And then what we do is we set up a six to 12 month plan for their marketing team to utilize that budget. And then we lay a foundation, we translate it into an actual team for them. 
It's worked out fairly well. But thank you for your insight. All right, let's pass along. Where does he have? Back here? Uh, I just want to say one thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, the information has been good. You've been an excellent host. And, thank uh, you. The food has been fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, so for me, I think one of the things that I picked up on is the, the need for networking and how you can utilize these social media outlets to connect. And I mean, obviously, I've met some excellent people here in all different sides of the marketing industry. And uh, for me, the big company that I work for, I'm not involved in their marketing. Yeah. So what I do is run run ads for small businesses on the side, and that's kind of just a little side hustle that I want to turn into something bigger. So I think networking is my next step. Yeah. And just to see what I can do from there and expand, and I've walked away from here with some excellent information on how I want to move forward. Good. So. I'm really happy to hear that. As you take that next step to your side gig, don't lose authenticity. You're going to have moments where you feel like you need to either deliver a certain way or you need to be a certain way. Don't lose authenticity. I'm extremely patient. You, you, you come across that way. <laughs> you come, it, it's, it's very comforting, but also, are you a serial killer? <laughs> Never know. I get a lot of shit for that because I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of serial killers are from there. <laughs> there we go, Wisconsin, home of patients and serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad that uh, I brought Adam to this to this conference because, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys helped convince him to get in and get on LinkedIn and do all this kind of stuff. I mean, we had a different direction. For our small little business we're starting here but uh, uh i think we we've definitely got more clarity on where we want to go with uh things so that helped a lot and uh, yeah we met a bunch of great people and made a lot of good connections so uh it was i didn't know how it was all going to turn out um but it, i felt like it turned out good it was worth it i mean i i've been to the huge conferences and now i've been to the smallest one i'll probably ever go to so <laughs> but it was worth it it was cool i got to know everybody personally so Good. Yes, please get on LinkedIn and and talk to as many people as humanly possible. I think it's, especially now, it's all about human connection. It's not about anything more or less than that. We've all realized. And if you are on LinkedIn, you see that there is a mix of people on LinkedIn. There are other people who go, this is a professional network. I don't give a fuck about your children. Stay off this. <laughs> and then you have the people who understand. You don't stop being who you are when you walk into work. You authentically bring all of your holistic self into every single experience that you're in. And once you start to mix those two, right, work-life balance kind of shows up in different ways for everyone. So, yes, please make a LinkedIn. Is there anyone here who doesn't have a LinkedIn? Okay. All right. Good stuff. I uh, actually have one more question. So all these slideshows and everything that we've seen, can we have access to those still? That is a yes. Okay. Okay, on, fantastic. On demand in a couple of weeks. The, so I downloaded the app because it told me to do that for like the schedule and everything, yeah. and then it gave me a password in my email. That doesn't work. <laughs> so I haven't, like everyone's talking about the schedule, and I'm like, yeah. I don't know where you're getting it from. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, schedule, I think the schedule's on the website. I don't know about the app. Uh, that is an Aaron question. But what do we need to get access to the video app? slides and stuff though is that just yeah i think it will just be sent out there'll be a link to the on-demand version or at sent least out. somebody that you can call i would assume just get a hold of them through the email that they've yeah, been sending all right. all right okay yeah cool thank you cool. yeah thank you hello hello how are you good good what i'm supposed to share what i've learned right yes okay. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Friday afternoon. Um, a lot of great things. One thing I stuck in my brain was the marketing doesn't end when the lead becomes a customer uh, because I'm in higher ed and I work with admissions and our alumni and admissions doesn't care about alumni and um, alumni doesn't care about admissions but I think I had to work with both those departments 
So I think it's that was a great thing that I can take back to them that they need to be working together as opposed to ignoring each other. Um, and then I liked the incentives. Uh, we incentivize our, our students who are admitted, but I love the idea of incentivizing students who are not certain yet by like maybe paying travel expenses or creating social groups for them for students mm -hmm. who haven't decided on a college yet. So yeah, on. and see the higher ed world is very interesting. We've uh... Well, I've worked with a couple of higher eds, both in technology and marketing. Biggest thing is community for those folks. Uh, most people who are in, even interested in higher ed want to talk to other people who are either in it or thinking about going through it. So it's interesting what you said earlier that uh, some of your folks want to have, a con have control over the narrative that's being shared because they all want to know that the narrative that, that's being shared is the reality of what's actually happening. Um, and that's interesting too, because it's also a talk on people's data, right? People want to make sure that the data that you see is actually either reflective of who they are as people um, and that they have access to it. So it's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. Well, hi there. Hello. Uh, let's see. I think I've taken at least a little bit of a, of a golden nugget out of every session. Um, there's always something to learn. And the one that's bubbling up for me now is with Kevin's discussion earlier about human psychological needs. And I kind of jotted down from my perspective, because I don't work in the marketing department, mm -hmm. right? We, we basically implement campaigns, but how does what we're saying in those campaigns actually answer one of those human needs, like certainty or safety, feeling valued, love and connection, variety, progress or impact. I think that's a, because sometimes, I don't know if you guys have ever had this, but it can be difficult with certain industries to come up with a great idea for them. You know, those ones where they're going, yeah, we're, like I asked them, what's the biggest differentiator that you have? Why would I do business with you? And they're like, well, we're kind of like everybody else, really. I mean, you know. We're just nice people. So I think coming up sometimes with it, having that framework, I think I'm going to use that to, to try to maybe guide that conversation a little bit more into how are you answering these particular needs for your customers? Maybe that'll help them think beyond service, you know, features and benefits in the yeah. same old story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I really enjoyed Kevin's talk too. I am. Um, like personally obsessed with psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to read people before I talk to them. I'm at a stage now where it, it's, it's borderline stalker level. I can look at people and tell you either what they're thinking, what they're afraid of, what they want, or I can tell you if they're nervous or if they're not nervous or how they're most likely to respond to certain things, right? It's one of the reasons I can say that I I can tell you that I can say the word fuck in this room and no one's going to be like, oh my God, it's oh, too much, <laughs> all right? Um, we've gone to that stage right now and we're building, we're building some of those practices into how we deliver, right? The great thing about this world is the more you become emotionally intelligent, even in your own personal life, that'll show up while you work, right? And you can apply that emotional intelligence to how you sell, how you deliver work, um, how you work with your stakeholders, right? One of the things that we implement is quite similar to that progress bar that Kevin was talking about earlier. So our program management team, every week they send out progress reports, but those progress reports look very boring to everyone who've got on one, right? Mm -hmm. well, we started implementing colors and a bar that shows people where they are in things. And we started seeing more engagement in that. So if you can correlate that this thing I'm starting is 70% done, you're right, like, you're like, all right, cool, we're almost there. Um, so the, the, the analytics behind how people are and how we all communicate and how empathetic we are to everybody's needs, I think is just the underlining level of where marketing is now moving into. Absolutely. Yeah. A conversation, not me just shouting my story at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we've had a lot of different sessions over the past couple of days. And, uh, you know, I, I, I personally really enjoy the one with Kevin because it resonates so well 
kind of weaves through everything we talked about. Yeah, really. yeah. It, it's like a nice closure, and then he ties in some psychology into it, and then he talks about how you basically just need to be a person. You need to be people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sort of this. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I think the the quote definitely that I'm taking away is don't do business with everyone who wants what you have. Uh, instead, do business with people who believe in what you do. Um, I personally want to continue to do my own marketing thing on the side. Um, and that leads into kind of what I was going to say about what I've taken away is that I just continue to want to learn. Like, <laughs> I just want to keep doing stuff like this, um, keep educating myself. I um, One thing that's kind of shocked me, I think, <laughs> um, is just seeing how immersed every single speaker here has been in the marketing world it's they can pull quotes off the top of their head from this person who had an interview you know (laughs) and it's like that's such dedication to immersing yourself in the marketing world in the digital marketing world specifically and just you have to make that effort and you have to try to be a part of that world and network and um it takes a lot of effort and that's why a lot of people don't do it. <laughs> um, and so I think that's really my challenge to myself is to go and and be part of that world and really just continue to learn. It, it's an organic thing. I think every marketer takes their own different approach to things and good marketers market as an extension of who they are. Um, so you have to do you have to remember what applies to you and what calls out to you, right? Like for me, that Simon Sinek quote, someone reminded me of that like <laughs> two years ago. Um, and when I heard it, it changed the way that I thought about business development and the types of clients I work with, right? It changed my mindset so much so that there are clients I will not work with. And I make that intentional distinction and I let them know, hey, we have something that you could use, but we're just not aligned in what it is we're trying to offer you. So there have been times where I've turned money for my company down. Um, and we understand why, right? Because our biggest net promoters, our biggest advocates, the one who sell for us with our other clients and future clients are the ones who believe in what we do. They're the ones who believe in who we are. Um, it's also one of the reasons why most entrepreneurs fail because they don't completely immerse themselves in their businesses, right? You can't work full time and work owning a side business. You have to choose one because when you do, that's where your entire existence is focused in. As a marketer, everything I do is literally marketing. Um, I'm a marketer personally, I'm a marketer professionally. I'm just a marketer because I've learned that marketing is about communicating, right? And when I communicate better professionally, I do it personally. So my little two cents, thank you. Megan, hello. Hello. Um, I would say that my biggest takeaway from this is how thankful I am to work at the company that I do. Um, just talking to all of you, I think I'm on one of like the biggest marketing teams here. I thought mine was small because we're like 10 people, um, but apparently this is pretty massive. Um, <laughs> and I know that everything that I took away from this conference, I'm going to be able to implement because my marketing team has the biggest budget of any department at my company and they really believe in growth. And I'm just so enthusiastic about bringing things back like Clearbit or Crystal Nose and Microsoft advertising. And I'm, yeah, I cannot wait to share that with my digital team. Yeah. All right. Round of applause. What is the name of your company? It's called Friss. F-R-I-S-S. I know them. Oh, do you really? I know about them. Okay. Nice. Yeah. We're big in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I did have a question for everyone. I want to know if you guys would be down to take a group picture too. That's part of my takeaway. Uh, yes, we are taking nice. a group picture. And then we can all post it on LinkedIn and build our networks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Another round of applause for you. Excellent. Great idea. Yes, marketing is what drives sales. Good companies like that. Um, we're in a good place. We, we've learned a lot over the past two days. We've all become best friends at this point, basically. Um, you know, we have about 
10 minutes till the end of this, so I'd like to throw it out there. Is there anyone who has any problems or challenges that they'd like some guidance or advice from anybody here on? Hiring. <laughs> Hiring for what? I'm what listening. Sales. So, yeah, we lost um, about 30% of our sales team in two weeks. Why? Uh, one person was let go, um, and two other people <clears throat> just found jobs for significantly more money. And we weren't able to convince them to stay. We almost had one person leave, but we were able to change her mind and she stayed with us. But Why did they leave? Um, just the promise of more money at other companies. We, I thought our company was phenomenal. Like, um, as soon as I signed on, I got five weeks of vacation, uh, which I thought was just absurd. Um, and you get healthcare, all kinds of other, like, you know, normal benefits. Our company culture is phenomenal. And yet we still lose people. Um, and I just don't know what else you can offer. How long have you been at the company? I've been there for a year and a half. Okay. And you still think the company culture is phenomenal. That's, okay. that, that means something. That really does mean something. Okay. What kind of managers exist in the set on your, on your sales teams? Pretty lazy fair. I'd say they're really, you're, you can be super independent. Um, and they have weekly check-ins, weekly catch-ups. Um, and then we do pipeline calls. Um, but yeah, really it's up to you and your successes, whatever you make it. How did those managers become managers? Um, it's a good point. Industry experience. Okay. Were they really high individual contributors who were made managers? I don't think so. Okay. All right. I think they were hired for management positions. Okay. So they came with that. And they, these obviously, these are people who wanted to be managers, right? Right. Okay. Um, at Matthew, we like to take this approach called always on recruiting. I kind of brought it with me. I've done it at every company I've ever been at. And it, to me, what that means is at every single moment in time and day in your life, you should be recruiting. Recruiting is not a HR function. It is an everybody function. You believe in your company. Yeah. You've basically sold that belief to everybody in this room. <laughs> if there is anybody who's looking for a job at a good company, they will probably can find you, oh, yeah. right? Take that approach. There you go, Shelton back there. Please go talk to her. Um, anybody who you talk to, you should make a conscious effort to learn a bit more about them, right? Um, over the past six years, I have built a very ridiculous roster of people who I've met who were like baristas at a drive through or who like told me they liked my shirt this one random time. Um, I've built this roster of people and I remember them. So anytime I have a need subconsciously, I'm like, oh shit, I spoke to, I don't know, Liz in Portland that one time she gave me my coffee and she's actually a really great people person, right? And then I talked to Liz and I found out a bit, a bit more about who she is and what she wants to do and what her interests are. And I don't look at her experience, right? I'm going to tell you something as a hiring manager, as someone who has hired over 500 people in three years, I don't look at people's resumes. I don't. <laughs> I don't look at people's resumes. I, I do look at people's LinkedIn's. Those are important to me. <laughs> yeah, your social, your professional social um, persona tells me a lot about who you are. So when I speak to people, I speak to people and what I like to do in my interviews, I ask them to tell me their story, right? Uh, earlier, Erin talked about the importance of storytelling and we were actually talking a bit earlier and we were talking about our interview experiences. I can tell you over the past six years, I have never had to be like, whenever I've gone into an interview, I've never had to be like, so I worked at this company and I did, I've never done that. The way that I present it to you folks is how I interview. I say, hey, I like to believe my career started in healthcare. And then I go along that line and I tell them a story because what's happening is we're all, again, trying to see ourselves in this story, right? So you've seen yourself in the story. And so I was just talking to people, don't let the, the cloud of what their experiences tell you to be who you see them to be, right? I've hired people who had zero experience in marketing. I've hired people who came from the restaurant industry and they are excellent. They are phenomenal people. Um, I've hired people who have had years of experience and those people crash and burn, right? So you've got to get creative in the hiring process. If you want someone who is a great salesperson, sit down with your team and ask, hey, 
what are the great qualities that we have in salespeople? Let's list out the qualities of those people. Go find those people, right? Be creative about it, right? And we did a healthcare campaign for one of our clients to capture key moments. We contacted a nurse. We asked the nurse to come along with us as we were collecting customer stories because that nurse could tell us where the, the key moments were. She could, she could literally be like, that's a special moment. And we were like, oh, cool. We would have never seen that, right? So get creative with hiring. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of companies right now talk about money being the issue for people. Like People can make significantly more elsewhere. I've had people take pay cuts to come work for me. The culture and the managers that you have is the most important thing. If your culture and your management isn't consistent with what you believe it to be, that is the first question I would start asking. Okay. Go from there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, it sounds like the way that you structured your question, it sounds more like a retention thing than necessarily the hiring. Because like, you could obviously, like some high vacation, uh, yeah. But it sounds like maybe their retention might be the issue because of the money. And also I was thinking too, is like, I feel like the whole building a community to sort of like, uh, build this sense of like obligation and responsibility and I know the whole like oh, like we're like a family not like a family like you know the weird parts of being a family but like you know the fact that you're like you know I am offered more money but I've been through like hell and back with these people are like they've seen me at work since I'm at my best because that's what I love about my company is that like in my darkest, worst times, they were there for me. And I'm like, I'm a server at a restaurant, okay? Like, but my bosses like were pulling me inside, like they were worried about you kind yeah. of a thing. And it's, and I, cause I started over there when I was 17. So I was a kid, you know? And they watched me grow up and it's been this whole thing, but it is, it, it feels so much more personal to me just because it is, it's, and it's more, I feel like it's more than just, let's, you know, let's have a week to check in and make sure everyone's doing well. I think it's like the, one-on-ones like hey let's go out to coffee let's make a, like a personal professional relationship so that way if someone gives you more money and you're like yeah no, i'm good you know like i'm happy with my my friends the people that i enjoy spending my time with and that's why i know those have been my experience i guess the best places that i've worked like i would totally if someone you said somebody just leave to go work at low tank because like oh the money's so good i'm like okay <laughs> yeah i uh a couple of years ago, I had somebody on my team who I could tell just something wasn't okay with her. Um, and this was a this was a, a review, and there were other managers there, and I asked all the other managers to drop. And it turns out she was going through a breakup, and we spent an hour and a half talking about her break. I cancelled meetings just to listen to her talk. Um, when our company, when the company was working with a couple of years ago, I got acquired, she took a $30,000 pay cut to come with me. Um, not only did she take a pay cut, she added more responsibilities to her to help support me in the transition. Um, and those types of things are things that money can't buy, right? It's authenticity. That's why I always question management. If if your culture is weird, it is your managers. It, that That's just it, right? There is a difference between really good and high quality individual contributors and there's a difference between managers, right? And um, Joshua and I were just talking about this earlier. Most companies take really high performing individual contributors and they promote them into management roles. And the managers go because oh, I want my career to progress, I want to make more money. Right, but there are other career paths that aren't just with management. There are other career paths where you could decide to stay an individual contributor and make more money, right? But when we're hiring for management specifically, we have to hire people who are inspirational. Like we heard it earlier, right? People are looking to be inspired. We have to hire empathetic leaders, right? We have to hire emotionally intelligent leaders. You need a leader who's gonna know when you're having a bad day versus when you're having a good day. And when that bad and good day have something to do with the company versus your own personal life, right? You also need a leader who knows that it is okay for you to be burnt out and to need to reset outside of work. All of those things are really important, right? Especially in this era where there's remote working, there's a huge difference between remote Remote working, working at home, and flexible working. Three very different things, right? Um, 
flexible working means. You work the hours that work for you to get the work done because I trust you as an employee to get your shit done. It's not my job to micromanage you. I know that we've got clients and we've got a task. So let's get that task done. And whenever you get that done, cool. You know the deadline. I trust you. Remote working, right? You work from home, but you also work nine to five, right? You're expected to be online nine to five working from home. There's like a silent expectation that you will come into the office occasionally, but no one ever tells you that because it's a covert thing and like, we're not supposed to make you come into the office, but like, you can work from home. (laughs) So I get really crisp about those differences. Those differences do exist. Anybody else? Problems? Anything you'd like to talk to? I think I could add one more thing to the recruiting thing, Mm -hmm. just to say... We've run a lot of recruiting campaigns lately, yeah. like other companies are experiencing this as well. Right. And, uh, I mean, there's some great tactics. But I, I agree with basically everything Jacob said. I just went through, I think it was an eight-week course on hiring. And it wasn't about, um, it's not like your traditional, like, how to find people. It was more about the philosophy of, you have to always be recruiting at all, and you have to have a bench. Agreeing also, Jacob, that we, we what you said about not hiring from a resume, we do take resumes and we have them apply, but there's something else. We work with a company called the Center for Sales Strategy, and they do basically a personality test called the Sales Talent Assessment, or if you're on a manager track, the Manager Talent Assessment. And it's We get a report back that assesses things that are, basically they took thousands of studies of people that were top performers in those roles and then assessed where they would rank on this test. So if they they fall below the benchmark, it doesn't mean that we can't hire them. We have the right and we've done it. But the people that tend to end up being super happy in the right spot, in the right fit, performing really well, hit above, at or above the benchmark line for those roles. So I, those are just some thoughts. What was that called? It's, uh, the company that does this is the Center for Sales Strategy. And they, the test is the, they call it the STA or the MTA, but it's the sales talent assessment or management talent assessment. They have other tracks, but, but then the, the last piece of it really what something they've been coaching us on through the hiring process is that it's not just about like getting people to fill out an application. There's a whole process around like pre-hiring, reaching out and engaging with people and making sure they feel welcome and that they're interested and that you're getting them into the funnel and realizing, you know, you are, we want you here. We want you to, when you get here day one, you're already going to feel like you're part of this team. Right. So I think when they did say quite often, I think several people said it, that when people leave, they join a company because of the culture, they leave a company because of the manager. So there might be something to look at. But. Well, I think part of our problem, just to give you all 32, is that the majority of our management base is based in the Netherlands, and the sales mm. people we're trying to hire are here. So they don't so. see their direct manager oh. probably very often. So right. maybe they feel disconnected. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a solve in there with even just something with, Zoom or Teams or something where they feel we've worked on it a lot with Cox trying to, right. I mean, we're spread out all across the country and yet you're trying to keep people feeling like they're part of the team. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah. can be challenging. <laughs> you know. That is also a huge cultural difference. Massive. People. They're so blunt, they so Dutch people. Yeah, and that, that doesn't really go over well in uh, America. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I can tell you that for sure. Um, uh, that that's a big difference. It's one of the reasons why DEI is so important. You have to have people who represent the areas that you are looking for, and you have to have them be able to feel like they can show up in their most authentic selves. Um, another tool I'll give you is Burke assessments. Burke assessments are fucking amazing. Oh my god, Burke assessments are so powerful because what it does it's, it basically takes the same approach, right? It, it scores people by taking them through this test and the test is not like 
you know, like a high school test. It's just a test that's mixed with some personality, right? Show me who you are. But what it will do is it will link itself to all the open active jobs that you have available, the jobs that you have in the company, and it'll tell you how well the person who took that test will line up to every job. So you're not just looking at their background experience, you're looking at their fit at the company all up. So even if this person applied for a sales role, but you saw that this person would be an excellent program manager, you can speak to them and say, hey, you know, you applied for this role, but I want to talk to you about this because this is actually what I saw a bit more about you, right? Um, I'm a huge advocate of tools. Another tool that I use to write all of my job descriptions is called Textio. I love Textio. It uses predictive analytics to tell me the right keywords to use when I'm writing job descriptions to appeal to the right people. Use something just like that, yeah. Yeah. Textio, what's the IO? Yeah, so it's text and then IO. Yeah, yeah. It's a great tool. It's, um, I've gotten lots of positive responses from it. Something that we noticed when we were writing job applications is that if you use masculine language in a job description, then only men will apply. But if you use feminine language in a job description, then both men and women will apply. Yeah. You know what's interesting about that? Most marketers, the, well, the marketing world is predominantly female. Have you noticed that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my North American team, of the legacy team of like 10 people, I'm the only female. But on my marketing team of 10, I think there's two men. Yeah. Do you know why? <laughs> naturally, naturally, women are more attentive and empathetic. Naturally speaking, when you are marketing, you're marketing from perspective. You're marketing to put yourself in the shoes of your audiences, and naturally, that comes easy to to most women, right? But now we're also, and if you spend a lot of time on TikTok like I do, apparently, <laughs> you're seeing that we're moving into an era where men are now being encouraged to explore their emotions. We're being encouraged to do more emotional intelligence work so that we can get to know ourselves better. And that's also showing up in the marketing spaces. So more and more men are moving into marketing. It's really interesting, the correlation of those two. Um, but folks, that is our time. That is our time. Thank you all. Thank you all. Please join us upstairs at, oh, uh, well, apparently I'm supposed to do these. Oh, the noise again. Lovely. All right. Join us upstairs it's on the 28th floor. We have a nice, nice food and some drinks. Enjoy. Happy, happy Friday, everyone. <laughs>